Hi, Govind. Welcome to my podcast. Thank you very much, Dheeraj, for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. Yeah, I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, Govind, uh, you know, I started, I wanted to start with this uh, whole space. Uh, you know, from a brand marketing consumer observation perspective, uh, we talk about that consumers today are looking for the truth. Uh, right. Uh, if you look at the whole rise in direct to consumer brands, uh, partly they've happened because you know, if you look at the back of the label, uh, it's all being told that this product contains so and so so stuff. It has SLS, it has uh, paraben, etc. In fact, uh, what's occurring is that the newer new age brands, which are being built uh, on the digital medium, are putting pressure back uh, on the legacy brands to say, uh, what ingredients are you using? Where are your products getting manufactured? What are the practices? that you're using so there is i mean uh not maybe at such a huge widespread level but there seems to be a culture of wanting to know the truth of wanting to uh to seek honesty and uh, and transparency uh right uh but at the same time right i mean we also also see uh on social media and otherwise you know there's certain narrative which is being fed and it 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 goes like wildfire like nobody's business uh and then you're like did nobody uh check for the fact and what's going on here so it looks like we're simultaneously living uh into opposing worlds or is that so are are these different audiences uh what are what are your experiences what are your observations uh around these so let me give you a quick history, you know, uh, and the the advent of misinformation or fake news or disinformation when when yeah. it's organized misinformation is called disinformation and uh, and disinformation today is run by military industrial complexes uh, across the world uh, in, yeah. in many countries uh, and is uses technology very efficiently. So to, so let me give you the history and the one or two examples that make the most sense. Uh, in 2016, uh, Donald Trump won the U.S. presidential elections. In the run-up to the uh, U.S. presidential elections, there was a barrage of fake news or misinformation, but delivered to people who were willing recipients in very, very creative ways by mm. people created by people who did not even know it would be used for that. So they were, for instance, people sitting in Macedonia creating completely fake news websites. For instance, a website would say, oh, did you know that Hillary Clinton is a witch? Or mm. did you know that uh, the Pope has blessed Donald Trump to become the president of the United States? Mm. So all these websites were creating content and largely for the luck and for Google revenue, uh, uh, earning because it's, and they found or they figured that it was becoming popular and they started doing more of it. And uh, they started earning uh, revenue from Google. So it became popular uh, uh, and because of the efforts put in by a bunch of people sitting in one corner of the world. Now, what was happening in the other side across the Atlantic, so to speak, was that there were some very smart people who decided that if we want to win this election, we have to figure out who is aligned to our cause. Mm. So then comes in uh, who had uh, an organization that had done some very interesting techno social experiments and work around in other parts of the world, that is Cambridge Analytica. So what did Cambridge Analytica do? They, they managed to pinpoint almost 80 million P Americans who had very clear preferences, likes, dislikes, with something only technology using uh, Facebook yeah. data could pull out and understand. So effectively, it knew uh, an, at the end of the day, an algorithm combining focus groups and hard, real on-ground uh, insights with uh, 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 data points could know what Dheeraj was about or what Govind was about better their than their own family members knew them. Because yeah. the way we behave and consume, the way we move from, let's say, one subject to the other, accept, reject, is something that we don't even share with our dear and dear ones, and we cannot. But technology yeah. can pick this up. So the the what the the the, the system did was to basically ensure that all this misinformation was delivered to those people who already were clearly aligned with the cause of electing Donald Trump. Okay, yeah. now. The thing is, the and and as the as the uh, flow began to get big, I mean, more and more, and it it became evident that people were so enthralled by this uh, this miasma of misinformation or disinformation that they would believe it regardless. So, for instance, if people were told later that, oh, listen, we have proof, and here is the proof that Donald Trump never met the Pope yeah. in, in the run up to the presidential elections, people would say, no, 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 you're wrong, hmm. you know. Or no, 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 it must be true. 
So that is the power of uh, uh, misinformation. That is the power of messaging when it's used for the wrong purposes. And that is why truth in itself can be a, a victim. Now, if you were to say that, okay, I was a victim of, let's say, knowingly or unknowingly, some disinformation stream, whether I was living in America or India or some other country at, at some point of time, either for political or non-political reasons. And I continue to be a victim because many other people are using some kind of messaging to target me. You know, in, I gave you the example of an election. It could be something yeah. else. I think what happens then is or begins to happen is that my trust in anything and everything begins to lessen. Yeah. Remember that we've already stopped trusting, we in the sense, a large number of people, particularly young people, have stopped trusting mainstream media yeah. across the world. Absolutely, yeah. And you combine that with the, the, the uh, erosion of trust because of this continuous messaging, which you half trust, are not sure, want to believe, like to believe. And I feel somewhere in all of this, the, the message itself, even if delivered by more and more honest people or honest brands, begins to start losing its value. And that is, I think, where we are today. So your, uh, your uh, sense, uh, Govind, is that uh, uh, from a consumer perspective, because we are lulled into so much of, say, mechanized and organized and at scale uh, misinformation or disinformation, you're saying our sensibility or our sensitivity to be able to wean the truth out of it has weakened as well, or, or would it would it lead to a counterculture of saying, because now we know uh, that we could be fed, uh, because now we know uh, that whether it's the consumption economy or the political economy, uh, that messages are being manufactured and fed. Uh, are there sections of people, say younger or millennial, who, whose antennas are, are say more up, who are now, uh, for example, in the consumer economy, are checking the back of the pack. That do do are you are you do you have arsenic? Do you have SLS? Is do you see the rise of that counterculture at all, or or no? So there there is a counterculture. Uh, it is I don't know if it's rising as yet. I mean, it's definitely yeah. there. It's strong. Evidence seems to suggest it's more prevalent in younger people. But this is more anecdotal than uh, anything else. That younger people question more, or uh, would tend to disbelieve and disbelieve almost everything. But at the same time, I think where we are right now in the middle of all of this, you know, yeah. uh, Dheeraj, if we had emerged from this and we looked back, we could have said that, you know, okay, this is what happened. But today yeah. we are in the middle of it. And it's mm. very difficult to say right now whether that message that you are giving out as a communicator, as a brand, as a journalist, is it being received and uh, and absorbed for the right reasons? Or is it being received, uh, is it being received only because I'm giving it out and only because I'm fulfilling some other either entertainment quotient or emotional quotient yeah. that that listener or receiver of that information might have. Or it might be, for instance, let's say, again, to use the US example, uh, it, it whips up uh, a certain emotional, uh, you know, uh, uh, cords uh, or yeah. even frenzy. Uh, yeah. If you look at what happened uh, in the in on the uh, 6th of January or 7th of January in the United States, the storming of the capital yeah. it was it was whipped up by a continuous flow of misinformation yes. right and and it was so bizarre when you look at those messages when you look at the kind of things that people were saying i mean you and to come back to your point i mean you really wonder we are living living in two different worlds now yeah. could both these worlds however be completely sane when it comes to buying that next bar of soap i don't know you yeah. know so that's a question that I have to uh, throw back at you, unfortunately, uh, yeah. because this is, like I said, we're in the middle of it. I'm trying to figure yeah. it out. I, I'm, I mean, this is, yeah. we're being bombarded by good people, yeah. by bad people, by not yeah. so good people, but yeah. uh, no, you're right. we're processing uh, this. Yeah, you're right. I think, I think we are seeing both behaviors, right? We are seeing a behavior, what I call the, India's a wave country. Uh, right uh, and and we we like uh, standing in the longest queues uh, right so if there's so many people at some place right i mean for example the, all the popularity myths of all the roadside vendors in india is about you know this guy serves from 11 30 to 12 15 and if you go beyond that everything's finished nobody talks about the quality of the food the fact that the person is so popular the fact that there are so many people right so we take popularity as surrogate for truth and quality, right? So we are a wave country and things which work, work, uh, right? The, the the worst kind of a product can work if everybody's using it, right? I mean, in automotive, for example, I mean, the cars which sell most in India aren't the safest cars. I mean, in fact, they're very tin-like, uh, right? Uh, but they sell because you can't go wrong buying uh, a car of the most popular brand because everybody's buying. So we see that, but we also see 
a dramatic rise at least on the uh, digital online younger medium uh, of brands and audiences who are questioning brands back who are questioning their authority uh, who are questioning authorities of really really uh, long time legacy trusted brands and saying what do you have what are you giving me what are you feeding me so we are seeing both we are seeing a simultaneously uh, kind of a polarized uh, behavior set uh if i may uh, say i mean you know, let me I mean, uh, dinesh yeah. let me quote an example to you you know the advertising standards council of india did a study recently or rather they uh, they put out the study recently and they found that only 12 of 332 advertisements relating to covid uh, were actually true okay yeah. now these are advertisements that are there uh, on the front page of your newspaper yes in see yeah. older people like me and you to some extent uh, also can still consume print yeah. and i'm sure elsewhere too Uh, i'm sure television i'm sure digital and you know and and this is stuff like saying oh here is a air purifier or something which will kill yeah. uh, the germs yeah. something yeah. else uh, take this and it will build your you will completely be protected and well known brands uh, yeah. and uh, and i wondered you know because i remember one or two uh, brands specifically in the uh, ayurvedic space that yes. how could they do that you know i yeah. mean uh, because they are uh, i mean these, i mean at least one brand is an well known older brand and uh, you know i mean i'm thinking will they i mean one is do they think they can get away with it maybe second is they're playing with science right yeah. uh, and 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 third is don't they feel that their consumers are going to get upset when they find out that it's not going to cure, uh, prevent them from getting covid yeah because all it does is rightfully build yeah. immunity and anything can yeah. I mean lots of things can build immunity yeah. but the number is what amazed me i i remember seeing all these advertisements in the last yeah. year but and this is the ascii number right 12 of yeah. 332 so yeah. you can, so now you see if if the next time i see an advertisement and i think i saw again another one during the paper just a couple of days yeah. ago saying that this is going to kill them or whatever yeah. right uh, and and uh, how am i going to believe it so yeah. if if and now in maybe in the case of covid because as a as a journalist i'm reporting on it i'm a little aware uh, and i'm pretty clear what the science says yeah. maybe other people don't and maybe yeah. they're still uh, buying it and even and i doubt how many people even know that ascii found all these uh, yeah. you know ads as yeah. curious yeah no my my sense really there is that i mean people have so much of disbelief of advertisements and i say so even 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 while i run a advertising agency right so uh, we are painfully aware of it and therefore the whole the whole idea of how we now craft brands or how we craft messaging has also changing right i mean i mean uh, i mean the really smart ones uh, brands etc would never put out a incredible message out there because you know to do you'll get found out in a jiffy right i mean it's such a huge mistake to try and mislead uh, people and consumers today because maybe 80% of them will not see it but 20% will see it and then 20% will make so much noise that it will kill all your equity uh, that you've built Uh, right so i would honestly say there's a mistake uh, you know a lot of clients for example come today and you you may you may know that there was a case of called puff right uh, a certain refrigerator brand sold itself uh, saying it has puff and puff was nothing it's, it's just Poly- the basic Poly- construct Uritin. yeah it's a basic construct of every uh, refrigerator system and today when clients come and say create a puff i would tell them you cannot because in today's day and age of transparency and information you cannot fake it right and it's more dangerous to try and do that uh, than be authentic uh, right uh, and and we 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 go more on relevance and connecting with people and telling a real story rather than claiming something about your product that you may not do or that you may not have uh, really right i want to i want to ask you uh, uh, you know govind about the several brands and the several offerings uh, that you are championing uh there's india spend there's fact checker and there's boom uh right i want to understand the philosophy the thinking behind these uh you know brands uh, how are you navigating it and also what's the response you're seeing uh, from both stakeholders and from people are i mean my question to you when we were talking was that people are willing to pay 1500 or whatever for a, a ott subscription uh, are people willing to pay for the truth i very much doubt they're willing to pay for the truth you know time and before i answer that question you know there've been many studies that have been done again post the 2016 uh, elections in the united states uh, and uh, including by mit uh, and other leading investigative journal- journals you know the thing is that uh, in most cases uh, people believe what they like to believe mm. you know and even if presented evidence to the contrary they will not change their minds and that is human nature 
So those mm. who learned early in the game to capitalize on this have really done it well, and maybe continue to do so. Let me give you one or two quick examples from India. You know, there was this uh, story that uh, or a picture that showed this girl who was putting pulling a, a hand cart with a man sitting behind, and the girl was a young girl, well dressed. And they said, "Look at this girl." I uh, I think it said something to the effect of this rickshaw puller's uh, daughter who uh, passed out of IIT, and uh, look at her; she's done so well, and all of that. So uh, uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, there was this photograph of uh, Nirmala Sita Raman, uh, our present finance minister, who was then defence minister, standing with a young girl in a aviator's uniform, mm. uh, standing next to a fighter jet, saying that "Look at uh, mother and daughter, both serving the country," and everyone was thrilled and you yeah. know congratulations and that's great and we knew it and all of that, right? Both photographs are fake. Yeah. As much as obviously it was uh, Nirmala Sita Raman standing next to a girl, but that girl was not her daughter. And yeah. similarly, in the other case, that was not uh, uh, you know the daughter of the uh, handcart uh, rickshaw rickshaw owner or whatever. But in yeah. both cases, people believed it because they felt it was a good story. It was a cultural conditioning. Cultural conditioning. So they said that oh, it's a uh, no, no, but it's a nice story. It just feels good. My own friends. I said, boss, what are you saying? This is. I said, this is fake. No, no, no. Yeah. Acha You know, uh, uh, but acha lagta hai. so people yeah. somewhere i mean and which is i guess the biggest challenge are and it's a challenge and an opportunity i guess are suspending belief yeah you know and in the world of misinformation and fake news globally we see it all the time and there is a temporary suspension of belief therefore people forward it thinking that oh others should know it too without applying their own critical thinking so anyway so let me come back to india span and we started it with the objective of uh, improving the quality of public discourse And yeah. my idea was that how do we use data and evidence to tell stories, particularly in public interest areas like health, education, environment, yeah. gender, which are foundational. The issues in these areas go back decades, if not yeah. more. Uh, this is not about this government or that government or whatever, but you know because we have to focus on this. And and I do believe because I spent uh, many years as a financial journalist that that we needed more journalists covering these areas because unless there is coverage then these problems yes. never will never get highlighted in yeah. the manner they are supposed to you know otherwise you're always dependent on governments and their wisdom which which is fine but there has to be reporting people have to talk yeah. about uh, you know the health i mean with thanks to, i mean thanks to covid in a very yeah. bizarre way we can see that problems with our healthcare system today in a most stark way but yeah. till covid happened we didn't know what are what are our fault lines you know yeah. do we have enough hospitals do we have enough yeah. beds do we have we enough no oxygen clue. do we yeah. have enough icus all yeah. that is now become uh, very can we distribute vaccines uh, can we manufacture vaccines yes we can more than anyone else but can we distribute yeah. them efficiently yeah. maybe not can do we have the software to monitor all of this perhaps yes uh, but uh, do we have the smartness to go out and negotiate uh, deals for vaccines globally and make sure that at least half a billion people get it maybe not yeah. uh can we move yeah. fast enough maybe not so so that that's the kind of thing that india spend uh, focuses on but uses and but using data and evidence uh, particularly yeah. uh, in healthcare and education which are our primary this thing so uh, we are basically uh, structured as a, a sort of non profit and for profit and uh, partly dependent on uh, philanthropy and uh, i therefore use this uh, quite shamelessly this opportunity to reach out to all Absolutely. those who listen to please donate yeah. uh, at indiaspend.com even a uh, 500 rupees goes a long way uh, it doesn't pay my salary but uh, you will be helping the cause of good journalism yeah. so uh, 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 we basically do about a story a day we combine on ground reporting with data crunching uh, usually done by people who have public policy uh, backgrounds and uh, we distribute these stories uh, uh, free of cost largely to people who are what we call our publishing partners so mm. you may not read our stories on india spend but you will read it on a business standard or a first right. post uh, or a scroll uh, new indian express dow jones news buyers so a lot we have a lot of partners so our reach therefore is pretty high despite the yeah. fact that we are a small uh, organization uh, 2014 just ahead of uh, the uh, the parliamentary elections in india which saw the bjp being elected uh, is when we started fact checker dot in we felt that yeah. we needed to fact check uh, statements made by people in public life and do it in a slightly different uh, website and uh, a more slightly different team as well uh, this was beginning to catch on in the united states uh, uh, there were yeah. a, a, a bunch of websites that started uh, i think uh, a couple of news networks also started fact checking their politicians and we realized that fact checking is different from general news reporting 
or, or news reporting as a journalist. So that's how we started Fact Checker and we continue to uh, till date uh, to, you know, fact check statements made by either people or institutions. So it could be, let's say, if uh, uh, the, uh, the prime minister says we have built X number of toilets. So we fact check mm. that. Uh, and uh, point out, I mean, the numbers would be right mostly, but we would always give the context. And the context yeah. is also very critical uh, in, in, you know, how many toilets were built, where were yeah. they built, how long yeah. did they take, how many existed before, uh, let's say, this government started off. So that gives you the context, which is also critical. So, and sometimes in many cases, we also find that information is, uh, is not accurate or wrongly presented. And we also reach out to them. You know, so we will reach out to those cabinet ministers or whoever and say that, listen, this is what you said. Do you stand by this? If so, or if not, so then uh, do let us know. So that's factchecker.in. In, in uh, 2016, for all the reasons I outlined earlier, we started Boom, <laughs> which is, yeah. you know, we realized that uh, misinformation uh, is a different uh, challenge. It flows yeah. subterraneanly. It comes mm. into our WhatsApp inboxes, which are end-to-end -end yes. encrypted. No, You don't know. And, and uh, it was around that time that I first noticed, I think in 2015 or 16, uh, that a Reserve Bank, I think it was almost like a seminal moment, a Reserve Bank of India put out a press release saying that there is no problem with Axis Bank or something like that, right? And the thing is, all the mainstream media journalists, my friends were scratching their heads and saying, but, are, but who, we never put out a story saying there was a problem with Axis Bank or, or yeah. whatever. But the fact is that it had spread on social media and that too, mostly WhatsApp. Yeah. And, and that, was after, that was really like a floodgate. After that, you, could, you regularly see, you saw and you see uh, governments, uh, specific bodies uh, responding to essentially what are fire, WhatsApp messages. Because at the end yeah. of the day, the Minister of Finance of India, I'm, I'm using finance because that's a space I'm, I guess I'm a little more familiar with, uh, gets the same WhatsApp message that you and I get <laughs> from yeah. some uncle, cousin, yeah. uh, you know, uh, auntie, whatever it is. And they say, oh, if I'm receiving it, that means half this country has seen yeah. it. So we yeah. better put out a, a clarification. Uh, similarly, uh, in in uh, in 2017, after GST launched, uh, in uh, uh, you know there was a lot of messages after July uh, about you know GST this happening and that happening and all of that. Yeah. And many of them were false. Uh, and yeah. many of them mainstream media you know would never report on it because mainstream media yeah. would say, okay, uh, we checked it out, it's fake. So why should we report it? Why should right. we even touch it? Yeah, but unfortunately for you, you may be talking about three million, but there are four hundred and ninety-seven million people who are consuming yeah. it, and therefore you have to respond. So that's how Boom was started, and right. uh, with a specific objective of uh, fighting misinformation. But over time, we've uh, 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 evolved at this point at least to two things: we we react and we fight, as in we yeah. debunk uh, 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 posts, images, uh, videos, and so on. And I'll give you a couple of brand examples. And we also uh, are proactive, as in we do stories where we feel that there is an information vacuum. And right. if we do a story saying, for instance, uh, you know, what is India's refugee policy? So people yeah. who are looking for refugees, Afghanistan, yes. India, yeah. will hopefully find that story and at least their questions Useful. will be answered yeah. before that yeah. misinformation thread yeah. start, uh, yeah. start to form. So a couple of years ago, actually, there are some very good brand case studies, uh, including with ITC Ashirvad Atta about, yeah. uh, I don't know if you remember, this was about how Atta uh, had plastic in it. And there were these videos where people yes, would take I Atta so, yeah. and yeah. Uh, make it into a ball and chuck it on the wall. Yeah. Right. And uh, it would, uh, uh, and the ball would come back and people yeah. say, look, this is by, because this is because there's plastic in it. Yeah. Then there was this other very famous, uh, there was Kurkure and then there was Lace Chips. Right? Yes. So someone would open a packet of lace chips, take it out, and then uh, light a uh, fire under it, I mean, uh, on a, yeah. with a lighter, and it would burn. And then they yeah. said, yeah, we, there, this is because there's plastic in it. I mean, it's actually because there's starch, I think, in it. That's the reason. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, both of these cause tremendous damage. ITC, yeah. actually, and maybe you should even get them on your show, you should talk to them about what they went through because of Ashirva Dota and the, yeah. the, 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 the loss in sales. Uh, yeah. because of that, uh, the fake news that was spreading and imagine, the time yeah. it took them to respond. Yes. Because I think the thing with happened, and I, I'm not sure it would happen uh, similarly today, but a couple of years back and literally a couple of years back, people were still not clear. How do you react to this animal, right? Because it's yeah. all going through WhatsApp. Yeah. And whereas all the tools you know of are uh, television, yeah. print, 
and and yeah. uh, and yeah. so on so you put advertisements in times of india or indian express yeah. but that doesn't help yeah. because yeah. that message is circulating furiously in eastern india in languages yeah. that uh, you know are not yeah. being touched or, at all or or many times many times you wait for it to tide over i mean as as a lot you of marketing business over. yeah you you feel that it, this will go away and then you realize no it's not going away and 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 then you wake up and it's 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 got momentum it's like fire it's it's, it's crossed the uh, chasm yeah so and and there are many examples like that and so uh, we cover three or four areas broadly i mean uh, first i would say is the most tough part which is the communal social and political which i guess yeah. is also the part which causes the most harm uh, including physical harm potentially uh, the second yeah. bucket is health and medicine which we were doing even before covid but that time we were focused on things like uh, ayurvedic cures for cancer and things like that yeah uh, but uh, post covid it's become about covid and now vaccination the third category broadly i would say is brands products and services uh yeah. which is including the kind of yeah. examples i gave yeah. you and in many cases companies have also reached out to us saying that you know uh, we are getting hammered uh, saying that uh, this product contains something something yeah. which we we know it doesn't <laughs> and we are saying it doesn't yeah. but really someone is spreading it uh, can you do something yeah. about it and so on yeah and tell me uh, tell me post covid when people actually i mean uh, the whole, and i know you set up a, a whole whole framework where you were fact checking and you were putting up resources uh, which were real and not fake but there's so much fake things uh, kind of doing the rounds on on social media even during covid in terms of uh, oxygen and beds and and i was personally for my mother in law looking for a bed in delhi and i was calling up places and 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 those were like normal number of some somebody has some vendor who's selling say pakoras in delhi or or whatever right all that was happening do you think that uh, that has changed is there a delta post there of people actually uh, seeking out uh, or having a question in their mind that maybe we should check it is it fact do you do you feel that it is moving at all in people's mind or you're saying these are too small events they're not black swans uh, for a dramatic shift so i i hope that the needle has moved I, as i do very sincerely hope and i know that a lot of people who tried those numbers for uh, hospital beds for remdesivir for plasma uh, even for let's say leads to uh, uh, for leads to get oxygen cylinders oxygen concentrators uh, were doing it out of desperation yeah and you know in desperation you start calling up any anyone and everyone and somehow you know why people do it deliberately and plant numbers which clearly are not the right numbers i don't know i've never understood this uh, very well but clearly it had become uh, a problem uh, i mean it scaled up or escalated very suddenly i mean and very dramatically which is why we started sos india for you uh, for yeah. uh, you and uh, dot com and where we were uh, at peak verifying uh, helplines at almost 123 cities uh and yeah. towns across india and uh, literally i mean there were about seven people who were physically calling up every number and then taking out the numbers from the app you know numbers which were Amazing. either unserviceable or not responding uh and obviously things would change right uh, suppose you say okay hospital beds available in indore in the morning yeah. by evening it's gone yeah it was a moving target would, by next morning we would have updated it so yeah. uh and i would see that uh, uh, even on social media people who was sharing messages uh, after I mean, maybe by and and may people were saying okay i have verified this or i have not you know please verify this before you uh, whatever so i think in pe- some people or sections of people clearly there is an awareness uh, and uh, there is an understanding that you know we need to check and but usually yeah. it's because you've burnt your fingers or you learned the hard way yeah now there are many instances like this right i mean uh, uh, in life as a whole i think we keep coming across messages we check and we find out that it's completely false or some hopefully wiser person in a family group points out that uh, you know like in my family group i'm not very liked because i keep pointing these things out <laughs> <laughs> and i even share out this thing uh, and i can see that some like it say say oh great great you've uh, given us uh, thank you for sending us or they'll check with me <laughs> and others don't like it because it seems to affect their position uh, you know yeah. uh, in, in suppose the, the suppose the narrative as you said that the, the narrative, narrative is, has become the opium almost. so it's a so i think so the f- problem is critical thinking i mean you know uh, are we born with sufficient critical thinking i guess mm. not uh, mm. even if we were born can narratives be shaped and woven uh, and manipulated the answer is yes uh, it yeah. has nothing to do with education it has nothing yeah. to do with education i mean i can uh, i someday someday i just want to make a list which i can literally make next week yeah of the people the messages they've sent me uh, and their net worth alongside you oh, know wow. i just want to do that and just circulate yeah. it and yeah. uh, maybe i won't be around the day after that <laughs> 
yeah <laughs> so, that is how it is yeah let's let's discuss the role of social media uh, in this i mean we've discussed a bit of whatsapp etc i mean uh, you know it's also at i mean again uh, during the covid etc it's also emerged as a platform uh, which has been a savior right i mean people found beds people found oxygen people found uh, life saving drugs uh, there were uh, doctors who were doing uh you know almost diagnosis uh, live on on social so there was one uh, that side of of social media that we saw uh but at the other end it's also the uh, the hotbed of spreading rumors it's also the hotbed uh, where you know uh, fake news catches fire uh, even before it's un- almost uncontrollable uh, do you feel the the issue lies uh, with the framework of social media does it need policing uh, is that where the the root cause is yeah i mean this is i think one of those big questions that we are facing as a society today you know so uh, as we all know social media in the way we know it today is 15 years old yeah you know before that uh, uh, iphone uh, i mean the iphone came and facebook came or uh, and started becoming bigger and then twitter came and so many other platforms came and google was of course around and youtube came so uh, you know as you know uh, or we all know facebook uh, even until about 6 years ago maybe uh, was the place where we shared our holiday pictures yeah. uh, we found our classmates uh, we connected with blood donation camps uh, we uh, created interest groups you know uh, i like collecting books or stamps and i find other people who do that and that goes on uh yeah. right i mean that's still happening so and that's the great thing uh including maybe th- many of those people who found help during covid thanks to social media uh you know about saying that you know i'm having a problem i mean there are people who were saying i'm my oxygen level is down to 80 someone yeah. please help me and i yes. know uh, yeah. unfortunately one person i know well uh, and a journalist lost his life but oh uh, but that's how he alerted the world that you know he yeah. was uh, literally dying uh, so uh, so that's the that's the positive side i think what's happened in the last 4 uh, uh, to 5 years or 5 to 6 years is really that people have uh, uh, figured that there is an uh, there this uh, pl- this technology allows you to do other things as well yeah. and that's how the evil has emerged and mm. i think what we are seeing today is really the evil side of the internet on social platforms yeah. uh, remember that uh, uh, platforms also drive commerce and commerce yeah. is something that has obviously evolved to our benefit as consumers you know yeah. today uh, i mean whether it's uh, services commerce or uh, yeah. product commerce uh, it's it's continuously evolving and when i say services it could be uber it could be amazon yeah. i mean as a product and so on and so forth so um, all that is the good thing i mean that's the good yeah. part about it but i think what we are seeing is the in social commerce we have, we've clearly seen the evil and the rise yeah. of the evil which continues to rise at this point as we speak mm. i don't know what mm. will happen mm. and uh, taming it is something that uh, i don't think people uh, in the tech world paid that much attention to because yeah. you know i mean as you know many of many technology companies are uh, in california libertarian yeah. uh, you know yeah. very uh, uh, you know left of uh, it's not left of center but it's libertarian you yeah. know uh, go post what you want it yeah. doesn't matter yeah yeah uh, if the system somehow doesn't like it it'll attack it but uh, you should be free to do what you yeah. want i should be free to yeah. do what i want yeah and that and what they haven't factored in is the compounding impact of the platform itself yes so yeah. so i think so that was then i mean uh, but i think what's happened in the last 3 4 years is uh, uh, civil society organizations uh, governments pub- public policy uh, uh, experts uh, and 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 many others have begun to push back yeah and we can see the push back right i mean yes. government after government is calling yeah. google and facebook yeah. Uh, yeah. or twitter and summoning them and saying you know why don't you have this why don't you have a compliance officer how yeah. uh, how you cannot allow this uh, post to remain and all that and give or take i mean different governments may have slightly different ways of looking at the specific content but largely i think uh, most governments have reacted some yeah. more in a structured way in europe for instance uh, some may be less structured uh, but uh, senate hearings in the united states or parliamentary committee meet, uh, 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 meetings in the in india the issues are the same that yeah. uh, how can social media companies be better managed can they be better yes. self managed and or yeah. and or should there be regulation that oversees them so the social media companies i think are responding in two or three ways and they have i mean one is i think uh, people like facebook and google and youtube have hired thousands of people yes uh, mostly uh, through indian companies or uh, uh, bpo kpo kind of companies uh, yeah. 
uh, I mean, Indian and non-Indian and working and who are doing the content moderation and so on. Some of them work with fact checkers like us right. and, uh, and, and we work with them. So uh, to bring in the physical element of it. So there's, yeah. techno- there's stuff that technology will do. There's stuff that rule-based content moderation, yeah. for instance, will do. And there's stuff that more physical. Uh, Manually you have to check. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so they're doing that. But I think, uh, I mean, to, uh, I mean, even if you take out the governments and the public policy and all that, advertisers are very powerful as well. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, three years ago, uh, if I remember correctly, Procter & Gamble, Levers, and one more brand or a couple of other brands pulled out of YouTube. Yes. Saying that, you know, yeah. we're not going to be posting, uh, I mean, our ads cannot appear next to some yeah. jihadi videos. I mean, in yeah. the sum and substance yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, YouTube had to, you know, obviously uh, yeah. uh, uh, beef up its act or get its act together and figure out how to, you know, make sure that the content was clear. So even if, uh, I'm, I'm not saying they did, but even if they said, okay, uh, you know, political pressure, government, and we can manage, but advertising gets tough to advertisers, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you cannot, uh, particularly if they become sensitive. More recently, uh, uh, advertisers pulled out of YouTube saying that uh, there was a pro- uh, there was a pedophilic content. And yeah. the, the thing was, and even I was shocked when I read the, you know, the headline in the first couple of lines. And then I read on and I realized that the advertisers were pulling out not because of children's videos. They were pulling out because of some of the comments in the comment section. Mm. So that is the kind of level of, let's say, integrity and quality yeah. and uh, purity, uh, if I can use that word, that advertisers want at one level. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, 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 I guess a safe space that parents and governments and others want, particularly yeah. when it comes to politics or other things. So overall, the pressure is huge. Yeah. Is it sufficient? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, because things happen. I mean, uh, just a couple, two years ago, uh, there was a gunman who uh, walked into a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand and started shooting people. And he, uh, he live streamed the whole uh, thing on Facebook and mm. Facebook systems did not catch it. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, how do you do that? I mean, yeah, there's a limitation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a limitation you know, I, I, to, yeah. So, but today, I mean, but that is not the way, uh, you know, I mean, a government would yeah. say, I don't care how yeah. you do it. I yeah. mean, you better yeah, you find a way. That system. Yeah. So, so they have, yeah. I think today, yeah. uh, as I understand yeah. it, they're able to respond very quickly to something like this in yeah. seconds, though even yeah. seconds can do a lot of damage. So, uh, but, but yeah, but I think in the race between good and evil in this part of the social internet, I think evil is winning right now. Right so the spread the spread is so fast you're saying yeah yeah the spread is so fast Excellent. see in countries yeah. like india Thiraj, as you know very well i mean we have gone from within four years or so we have gone from yeah. maybe 7500 million mobile phone subscribers smartphone subscribers to about 500 yeah. million smartphone yeah. subscribers absolutely data rates yeah. have come down so there's been yeah. a huge infrastructure accompaniment yeah. which has yeah. obviously driven the phenomenon yeah. of dissemination yeah. of information and yeah. uh, and therefore also misinformation yeah. Yeah. And, and nobody's bothered there, right? Nobody's bothered there to check that this could be wrong. I mean, you're just consuming it because you are used to consuming narratives from media, whether it's television yeah. or newspaper, you're just used to, you never questioned it. Right. Yeah. And that's really digital literacy as we call it. I mean, you know, which is not the same as literacy. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, earlier we used to say, okay, the, the, any word in cold print is the truth. You yes. know, the, the newspaper, yeah. when you pick it up, yeah. old print, I mean, that right? was the semiotics of it, right? I mean, yes. it's written uh, is, 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 is the truth. Yes. So, yeah. so I guess people are, do the same thing when it comes to, uh, you know, you put an image and you say something below that. It looks like this is from, uh, you know, some newspaper or some organized yeah. outlet. Yeah. So you believe it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, when it comes on WhatsApp. So anyway, I mean, I think on the bright side, I would always hope that uh, sometimes if there's too much of it, it re- results in it natural does have selection. A, it does have a, yeah. And it also have a counter counter impact, right? I want to shift gears a bit and I wanted to discuss with you the role of data, right? You talk about a role of, role of data uh, and using data to tell stories. Uh, also using data to impact public discourse and, and public opinion. Uh, right. Uh, so, so where are you on that? I mean, uh, are there situations where you think that uh, use of data could have uh, helped change perception at a mass uh, narrative level? Or do you feel that people still buy the soft narrative and people are inclined to buy the soft narrative? They really, the mind is collectively being wired to ignore hard fact and hard data. Where's your experience on this piece? I think so. I mean, I, I mean, you're right. I mean, and you've really summed up what anyone would, uh, anyone would say, but, and, and I would also, I mean, uh, take some blame for that, you know, because 
finally uh, if we are the communicators i mean so it's let's say it's my grand uh, dream that uh, you know uh, we can change or improve the quality of public discourse by using data right that yeah. means next time you and i have an argument uh, i will use some data point to substantiate uh, yeah. for instance i try to use a data point by saying that okay uh, an ascii study showed that only you know 12 companies uh, had genuine ads out of uh, 300 companies uh, you know so uh, that's a data point now yeah. you may not believe it that's a different issue but yeah. at least it frames the frames the issue rather than me saying i think those ads were fake and maybe yeah. i i'm telling you i'm uh, i'm convinced all that advertisements are fake but if you ask me suddenly how do you know and then i'm saying no 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 I, this is my this is my <laughs> intuition or based yeah. on my reading of the newspaper or whatever so but you know but the challenge uh, uh, dheeraj is that uh, we have to communicate it we have to communicate yeah. the 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 uh, the core message which is that you need to use data and we have to communicate the data so today yeah. uh, unfortunately a lot of our messaging is picked up but it's only picked up by people who are uh, in a way already converted yeah. you know the challenge for us is to say how do we convert more and more people and therefore can we make our use of data and the telling of data better and better or simpler and simpler you know if yeah. you the, the big guru in this space is hans rosling yes. you know who is yeah. sort of, yeah, who's of the, who's the, yeah. who was the master at uh, yeah. you know using data and very very long and visualization like, yeah and visualization right yeah. so it's a holy grail for us uh, you know yeah. are we doing are we reaching more people than we started out with of course uh, definitely yeah. and a lot of young people uh, but the many of those young people who take who consume us and uh, reach out to us are also in some ways already converted i mean yeah. they come from public policy backgrounds they've done a masters yeah. in economics uh, or they're pursuing uh, let's say uh, 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 mba i mean yeah. you know people are already tuned in so i think uh, the challenge still is uh, is it's a big challenge and it's a big task for us to ensure that you know uh, we communicate the importance of data to more people and also find ways to communicate it better and smarter yeah uh, which yeah. i think i would uh, confess out at the outset and outright that we have not really done enough yeah yeah so we've had some experience there govind right i mean for example we we did a campaign for hdfc bank on blood donation right and typical blood donation right you say you know we need x amount of uh, blood and we get only y so please come and donate and nobody really cares for that and and we realize that the insight in india is that in india you would go to any extent to help somebody that you love or that yeah. you care for but you wouldn't donate or you wouldn't do charity for somebody who's who you really don't know so we found this uh, guy right mr mathani who's been donating blood every year and he's now 65 and he cannot donate blood and he made we made a big deal about him right so we we got people fall in love with mr mathani they look at him he's a real guy has been donating and now he cannot donate and he's saying if you will not donate uh, blood he's going to go and donate right and we put a ticker in front of his house uh, and so on and so forth and we put a number that if you reach this number he will not and that worked beautifully i mean we that year uh, we 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 gathered more blood than we managed every year through all other because we made data personal right we 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 humanized uh, data and, and we, we told the story in a way that people could connect with it uh, you know yeah. so that could be uh, one of the solves it is absolutely and i think yeah. uh, you know particularly in areas like uh, uh, you know we've seen it uh, in in areas like understanding uh, why uh, girl ch- girl child uh, children drop out of school yeah you know everyone said that uh, everyone at least until recently uh, you know assumed that this was because uh, uh, you know the parents were conservative and it turned out that uh, and this is sort of a data and evidence play right and it turns out that uh, girl children o- often drop out of schools because there are no toilets yeah. uh, uh, or uh, good yeah. toilets for girls so um, as they get older uh, or uh, and and, and uh, period issues i mean we were exactly. to spur a so, lot on that yeah so they so those are reasons uh, why they yeah. drop out uh, and uh, so therefore it was not an education or a social issue challenge but yeah. it was an infrastructure challenge infra infra and the supply so that, is, so that yeah. is the power of data i mean you know when you understand it of course for those who know and manage public policy they know this but yeah. sometimes when ordinary people know it and understand it they are able to put pressure upwards right yeah. saying that no, okay absolutely you know, Yeah, uh, you in fact, know, we this... do a lot of communication around that, and the data is one one in five, right? Uh, girl right. children, and we have a program called Keep Girls in School uh, that we're championing with Whisper, and again sensitizing that, making uh, making that you know friendly to people uh, to to capture that uh, information. Exactly, 
so uh, and and that's a very good example uh, and and on on real ground and you know there are many such examples uh, about uh, you know for instance uh, in education uh, you know where now we are seeing uh, you know women's participation in the workforce reduce i mean it went yeah. up and then it's now coming down uh, yeah. including uh, uh, because women are better educated uh, maybe they are dropping out of the workforce uh, or maybe uh, uh, there is sufficient income in the family and they yeah. don't feel the need though they could yeah. uh, you know so there are many reasons but i mean but it's it's these are all shifts which yeah, uh, yeah it's a big looking thing. at data you yeah. will not understand then how do you frame policy yeah you know how do you uh, you know one you, you have, we have to we all have to i mean we all know it i guess but we have to remind ourselves if you fix education and healthcare in a country most of your problems will get solved yeah you know foundational yeah. problems i mean yeah. there may be other yeah. problems but i'm saying foundational problems if you fix these two and uh, and it's a circular kind of thing because as you educate and particularly if you educate women and girls uh, yeah. and girls uh, automatically uh, the way they bring up their children the nutrition yeah. it changes the whole everything change. changes and yeah. i'm sure your studies have yeah. shown you that too as well yeah. and the and, and the country kind of everything improves right and yeah. and to understand this particularly in a large country like india you need data you need evidence yeah absolutely absolutely uh, so anyway that, but that's it that's for policy makers i'm saying so how do we uh, uh, turn that data around and use it uh, to tell people i think one of the biggest opportunities and challenges for us right now is climate change you know yeah. uh, you know we worked on a project called breathe uh mm. which we kicked off in uh, 17 uh, under india spend where we uh, basically uh, and this all started because i uh, you know there were these articles that appeared in foreign media saying that yeah. how delhi was becoming impossible to live in yeah okay and uh, so we said that okay how do you measure it and the, we found out that there was no way to measure it there was only one uh, a, a couple of monitoring devices that the central pollution control board or the delhi pollution control board had but these were all offline and uh, you know they once in one month you could go and collect the data and so on and uh, the government was just beginning to set up what became the safar network and uh, uh, there was one monitor i think on top of the us embassy in chanakyapuri mm. which was you could actually see what the real time uh, pm 2.5 and pm 10 mm. i think pm 2.5 numbers were uh, particulate matter so we actually set up and i we found out that basically the cost of sensors had come down so we set up our own network of monitoring stations and we launched it in delhi wow. we set up 20 yeah. monitoring stations mostly kept in balconies of friends yeah. which were uh, uh, you know and the sensors were costing only 30 uh, yeah. and pa- mated to gprs uh, uh, gprs transmitters basically your yeah. uh, mobile phone sim card yeah. uh, like a box and it would measure and send the data and we you could actually see it real time on a map amazing and yeah. you could zoom in so you could say vasant kunj uh, you know is this much uh you know shanti shanti uh, uh, shanti niketan is this much and uh, cannot yeah. place wherever we had sensors yes so uh, and for the first time it became clear how bad the situation was yeah. till then everyone described yeah, the problem yeah it is anecdotal yeah anecdotally figuratively you know my uh, i'm having uh, this thing my children are having uh, you know problem uh, i keep going back we have to buy nebulizers Yeah. Uh, but no one ever put data to it so actually that's uh, you know for us as india spend that has been our biggest success in a way yeah. that we could find a way to draw attention not just to the pollution problem but also to the larger problem you know pollution yeah. is a is a manifestation of climate change i yes. mean it's not a direct manifestation but yeah. it's a manifestation so uh, at peak we were manit- uh, mo- monitoring uh, over 20 uh, this thing people could start seeing uh, real time all the news many of the news channels started taking that data yeah. uh, some uh, two news channels wanted devices on their terraces because they said no we want to show what it is right <laughs> yeah. and, and they did that uh, and uh, uh, predictably or not predictably the up government in delhi started fighting back saying that these are all yeah. uh, low cost devices yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know the uh, uh, real devices have to be uh, they're much more they cost 15000 dollars yeah just true they do Yeah. Uh, these cost only two hundred dollars. Yeah. But the fact is that th- using uh, good software and uh, you know the right amount of uh, pre-testing, you can you know you can make sure that you capture the trend. Yes. So and you started the conversation. Yeah. And you started right? the conversation, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. you know, and and today, I mean, uh, uh, so people uh, accepted that you know this was good enough. I mean, I did not need to know whether the uh, uh, AQI or the air quality index number was eight uh, hundred or whether it was seven hundred and eighty nine point nine. Right? Yeah. It is. Yeah. I mean, That's not the point. Is, it is crazy, and it is definitely in the right direction. Yes. So, 
so i think people accepted that what we were doing was accurate and important and around the time the government also started working in it uh, delhi government said okay we will set up uh, more stations and i don't know but though that project never worked out i think but the fact is that air quality today is a page one mention point particularly yeah. in winter yeah absolutely you know earlier it wasn't earlier you, yeah. you know you know you only see weather and yeah, so you would on. say and you would say fog there's fog in delhi there's fog. Fog in delhi. so yeah. so we can take yeah. some credit for that yeah. so i think yeah. that's one area where we managed to you know use a, a communication method or whatever and and we made it real time the real time thing worked and we tried yeah. up with twitter by the way uh, so yeah. what would happen is you just had to say hashtag #breathe uh, you know uh, hashtag #breathe cannot place Yeah. and twitter would send you an image of the, the data uh, of yeah. the data you know saying that Amazing. okay this is it and it's fair or low or whatever it is so we tied yeah. up with uh, uh, twitter for that so i think uh, climate change broadly as we yeah. look ahead and we are trying to crack uh, i mean we are think, doing a lot of thinking on that i mean we can so you know the number of monsoon uh, extreme monsoon events that we are seeing even right in mumbai where both of us live yeah. is easy yeah. and the data yeah. is already showing that so we want to mm. see how we can uh, work on these kind of data points and build so that people up. feel it yeah and yeah. are already feeling it uh, yeah. and yeah. hopefully that will uh, yeah. help expand the discourse yeah yeah so uh, last question uh, govind i know we are running out of time uh, i mean how what are the challenges of of being a media entrepreneur right building building media brands uh, i know there will be lots but what are the top top ones that you facing right now so uh, i think the big challenge is clearly resources <laughs> I mean, yeah you know we are not built on uh, advertising models nor are we built on uh, whipping up uh, uh, frenzy at least what we are doing yeah you know i mean you can uh, a subscriber model can work pretty well if you are able to you know whip up some kind of uh, emotion uh, yeah. we don't do that so we've taken the yeah. position that we want to be uh, un, i mean without any opinion we want to use data and evidence and everything we do so i mean resources are tough i mean there are yeah. uh, there are some who support us and support have supported us through and through and we uh, are yeah. in perpetual gratitude to them uh, and we just hope that more people uh, will uh, support our efforts uh, yeah. and uh, subscribe to uh, what with our offerings and it all costs very less uh, the price of maybe a coffee or two in starbucks uh and Amazing. that goes a long way yeah. so but and i also realize that uh, the challenge uh and uh, is equally upon us to communicate our needs uh better and also uh, the importance of all of this you know yeah. i have to kind of finally tell you why this is important uh if yeah. i have failed in telling you that or if i fail to communicate that it's a yeah. failure right so that yeah. that is something that uh, i'm also so it's a frustration i i, I you know it, it's a, it is a frustration and it's also like a looking glass right i mean you have to tell yourself yeah. that yes yeah. i have to keep thinking of how i can uh, rephrase this or do this differently yeah. so yeah i i would say those are some of the challenges of being a media entrepreneur particularly in yeah. this kind of space where we have chosen niches uh we are going yeah. after specific markets but usually the uh, the benefits the fact that we've got so much uh, uh uh good i mean uh response and uh, particularly from young people who want to work with us uh we've got so much uh, acknowledgement by public policy makers uh, across the world you know one yeah. of our uh, at india spend particularly one of our uh, achievements in a way is the number of citations we get high quality yeah. citations we get from yes. uh, leading academic institutions around yeah. the world yeah. and i would argue that we are one of the highest uh, for what we do uh, in uh, yeah. definitely for a quasi media organization so yeah. um, so those are those are elements of pride yeah and yeah. Uh, 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 the fact that we can uh, do something to shape the quality of public yes. discourse no. and also that we've survived 10 years somehow oh that's <laughs> awesome yeah also and, i yeah. i think i think the culture is coming to a stage where you know this is bubbling up uh right and and there will be more and more value uh to the work that you're doing and the data that you're bringing uh, to the table i hope so yeah thank you so much for this conversation govin uh it's been a really enjoyable chat thank you so much deeraj it was a pleasure talking to you and in talking to you as always i've uh, found some more ideas and inspiration to do the work that i am doing so thank you so much again absolutely thank you so much bye yeah bye bye the conversation govind is when i turn the mic back to you and uh, you get to grill me back uh, as as i've been grilling you for last one hour so are you dheeraj and that's that's uh, obviously something i'm looking forward to so let me kick off uh, according to you dheeraj what's been the biggest challenge the pandemic has posed to the world of marketing that is 
I think the biggest uh, biggest challenge uh, that pandemic has brought is really about people. Yeah, it's it's been you know because uh, we've all been locked in homes, right? We've been trying to run organizations, uh, and it's been now eighteen months, uh, right? How do you how do you run organizations? Uh, people are uh, facing threat to their health, to their loved ones, to relationships, to mental well being. Uh, I would say those are the biggest uh, biggest challenges uh, that we have faced. Uh, for our organization and marketing advertising is very uh, you know brainstorming creative space you are together you're doing it and that energy has gone zero and and that's been uh, i mean we've suffered the most because of that i would say so would you say that's the thing that you miss the most about the pre pandemic world as well the energy creative yeah flow. yeah yeah that only right i mean for example i love the fact that i don't have to spend 4 hours in traffic anymore i love the fact that uh, you know door to door i am not doing a flight which is 5 hour one way and 5 hour another way and a 45 minute in bangalore uh, meeting in bangalore so i i love all of that i love the whole uh, uh, you know the the efficiency going away from that perspective but the energy of people you know creating together seeing face to face because just the zoom window and you don't get to see what's happening behind that window is is very very limiting right dheeraj so uh, what's a name a book that's uh, changed your perspective on life and obviously uh, i know you're a prolific author yourself so you can't name your own book <laughs> <laughs> i know i mean i i, I like uh, nasim taleb's uh, writing a lot so i would say anti fragile uh, right in a big way and I, i i mean the whole theory that you know the world chases Uh, the event, right? So, for example, he spoke about that fact that you know uh, terrorism has destroyed the world. Now, all dollar uh, in the world will chase in preventing terrorism. But what will screw the world now? Won't be terrorism as much as something else, and that's what has happened. So, so the need for us to be fluid and to be able to imagine uh, what we need to go after rather than looking at the past, uh, you know. How do you apply that in your own uh, life? Oh, hugely. I mean, for example, uh, you know, when uh, uh, when uh, pandemic hit us, uh, go when we, uh, I mean, foot one day right here, we are four hundred fifty people at Leo Bunner, and we haven't gone to office. And I woke up that morning, and I was like, what would these people be doing? What would they be thinking, right? And we don't know how long this is going to go. What are we going to do? How are we going to navigate? One is life and other stuff, but people need purpose, right? You want to wake up every day morning and say, what am I going to do today? And therefore, we created a tool. Uh, right we created a compass that i called 036 and i named it short term thinking right because i realized that everything in the world was about long term thinking all business models all brand thinking all policy was in five year horizon or a 10 year horizon but here it is about short term thinking am i going to survive today and i said okay zero Three and six. So say we said, what are the culture fuse or patterns in zero? What are the culture fuse going to be in three and six? And what are my equities as a company or a brand? And what can we do, right? So for example, with Whisper, we realized that pandemic uh, had its own own uh, own patriarchy. So uh, girls and boys were at home. Boys were getting the devices. to study uh, and and log into online classes girls were being sent back to chores and therefore with whisper we set up something called as a mobile shala a platform for girls uh, a part of this uh, this program where they can access education at their pace through feature phone in their language uh, without being a nuisance to their family yeah and and i saw one of those ads on uh, youtube it was quite nice i mean there's a yeah. girl who's looking through the window yes, uh, yes, yeah yeah i think yes. it was a beautiful ad uh, i yeah. didn't realize it was yours yeah yeah it's our work yeah great so and and i'm assuming that also answers in some ways partly and you can expand the uh, the other question is what's the positive change that you've seen in your organization post the pandemic yeah so again i think it goes back i think what what threatens you also becomes your biggest strength uh, govin you would realize that so i think people coming shoulder to shoulder right i mean i would say this one thing which uh, defines my culture today is the sense of camaraderie right i mean the way people have stood up to help each other without pursuit of their personal kind of a goal right so we've become one collective we become a village this wouldn't have happened uh, otherwise so uh, uh, slightly uh, shifting gears so you know uh, you're a creative organization you need creative people working with you uh, you need people with high energy you need people who yeah. understand what's going on you need social scientists uh, as much as uh, creators yeah. and uh, you know uh, creative people so what's the uh, one or two interview questions that you feel reveal the most or, or the most ideal uh, tenets of a good and potential employee so this is one question i ask uh, govind is that tell me one story uh, right that you are proud of and that give you joy in life 
I don't care whether it got celebrated. I don't care whether your boss liked it. I don't care whether your client liked it. But tell me a story that gave you personal joy. I always ask that question, and to me, I mean, that's the game changer question that I ask. And and what's the kind of answer that you've got, or give me an illustration of an answer that you've got so, uh, which has so, impressed you. So I mean, typically the the ones the answers that I mean that that make the person cross the gate are are maybe could be something which is very uh, small as a story, but. brought that person so for example somebody said you know i did this piece of ad and and so on and so forth but the joy was when it came back through my mother's whatsapp network back to me <laughs> right and that that i mean to the conversation we've been having today is a test that it's actually floated <laughs> and and that's a that's a very uh, interesting and opportune note to end on thiras thank you so much uh, yeah. once again to sum up uh, for uh, this opportunity to speak with you uh to hear your thoughts uh and uh, it's been a really wonderful hour and 10 minutes or so thank you Amazing. once again thank you so much for doing this you can reach me at govind athiraj on twitter i'm also on linkedin i am not on most of the other platforms that you most probably are particularly if you're uh, younger than me and uh, yeah and and uh, do visit our websites that indiaspend.org factchecker.in and boomlive.in uh, and uh, keep the good fight up against uh, misinformation and use data and evidence to improve the quality of all our lives